combien de temps ça prend pour dire le mot fraise de la terre à Mercure Comment on fait de, pour parler de la terre jusqu'à Pluton So these first questions are, I mean, I will probably address this question first to Jean-François. Um, you understand the question, maybe I can translate. The question is, how much time does it get to communicate, basically, from, from the Earth to uh, Pluto? And if you say the, the word fraise, how much time it would take? Yeah, I don't know by heart the distances, but I guess it's a few hours for Pluto, if not a few days. Uh, for Mercure, it's uh, probably a bit less, since the sun is about uh, seven minutes light uh, away. So Mercure sometimes is on the other side, sometimes on our side, so a few minutes to Mercure, but probably uh, many hours for Pluton. So no way to talk real time with the inhabitant of Pluton. And how Just would that translate into distance uh, Earth, Mars, or Earth, Moon, as that's the where we're going now with human, human uh, flights. Michael, you want to answer that one? Well, the um, Earth to the station, which is in low Earth orbit, is practically instantaneous, you know, less than a second, obviously. We have conversations which to us appear to be real time. It's probably as much time to get from the, from the vehicle all the way up to the relay satellite and then back down to Earth. So. It's practically zero. Moon is roughly the same, 250,000 miles, 400,000 kilometers. Um, but Mars would be a very different story. And um, part of the uh, challenges that we face as we go there is how are we communicate what sort of um, autonomy we have to give to the crew to be able to, first of all, take decisions and then um, take actions on things that may happen. Whereas today, we would certainly consult with the team in mission control. So all those are big differences in operations that we'd be facing when we go to Mars. One of the reasons these uh, young kids have asked this question, which could actually be very complicated if we, if we go a bit in, deep, in depth of, in that, uh, Sergei, the, um, the background of this question is all about communication. Uh, you get an instruction or you have a problem, how do you, how do you transfer uh, these problems to the ground and how do you, how do you actually uh, survive these uh, difficulties of being remote uh, in, in the space station? Uh, you know, we, when we flew on space station, uh, especially initially on the first stage when we flew on Expedition 1, uh, majority of communication we had through uh, ground stations. And of course, you can communicate only when you are in uh, ground station site, d direct site. Uh, so basically, it means that in one and a half hour of orbit, you have communication from five, 10 minutes up to 25 minutes. So we, even if we fly uh, around the Earth, it doesn't mean that we can communicate uh, all the time. Right now, with uh, communication on the station. Now we, we are able to talk to the ground every minute, basically, except few few minutes maybe for a satellite handover. Uh, but I think uh, that's what we discuss among our specialists and engineers, that if we look at the station as, as the future outpost for our preparation, our training for further missions, for missions to Moon, Mars, and further, uh, we probably need to uh, operate more in autonomous mode. When we make decisions on board, we probably uh, have to have some kind of technical tools to have uh, capability to make decisions on board and to be able to solve the problems on board. And we can start training to these uh, future missions now. I think you're particularly well placed to talk about that if we, I remember we called you the last Soviet citizen when you were up there on board after the flight with Helen Sharman, and you definitely had to improvise everything, <laughs> including repair, and you, you didn't have a way to, uh, to get provision. And, and, uh... Uh, even if you have provision, it cannot be delivered immediately. If you have problems, sometimes it takes a few weeks uh, on ground to prepare equipment and maybe send, send it up on next progress. So 
delivery for tools or equipment may take several several weeks. Leo, you had um, when you talk about communication, we talk also about culture and languages. Can you can you give us your um, your feedback about how this uh, is uh, is actually taken by astronauts? How to train and adapt to the change and the difference in cultures and communication? Um, <clears throat> Of course, astronaut training for the International, International Space Station, we, we spend a lot of time in training in different countries. So, of course, the training is probably the, the main part where we are learning how to, uh, uh, to deal and interface with our uh, other cultures and other languages. So, I had the chance of uh, flying 10 years ago in the, in, on the Mir Space Station, so I was a little bit prepared to the, uh, to the Russian and uh, culture and language. Uh, but uh, they, this is quite a big uh, deal, I think, for the newcomers and the people who are starting training and uh, have not been uh, um, exposed to uh, other languages, in particular the Russian language, um, in, the, in the past. So, uh, yeah, they, I think the training is a key thing for, for preparing for these aspects. And Satoshi, when we have an enormous difference uh, between the cultures, uh, how, how is this trained in Japan? Well, uh, to me, it is very interesting and useful to have various kinds of crew members in a team. Because uh, crew members from different languages, culture, and specialty make a team. And uh, the, the diversity is the key. I mean, uh, the, we respect the differences with each other and enjoy them. And, uh, we make the most of each crew member's strong points so that the, the team as a whole works very well. So it's very interesting. <laughs>